What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today I'll be sharing with you an $800 gaming and streaming PC for 2021. The PC hardware market is a little weird right now, but I'll offer some alternatives if certain parts are sold out. In this video, I'm going to be showing you each of the parts, talk about why I picked them, and show you how this system performs in a bunch of games. And then next week, I'll release a full step-by-step -step tutorial on how to put this system together. Now, one of the best ways to protect a computer like the one in this video is by using the YubiKey from today's sponsor, YubiCo. The YubiKey is a physical key designed to make signing into your computer and online accounts both simple and secure. You can use it to add two-factor authentication to your PC, meaning no access unless the key is inserted, and it it can be used for two-factor authentication with your online accounts as well. To learn more about the only form of two-factor authentication with FIDO support that's proven to protect against phishing attacks 100% of the time, click the link in the description or stick around for more information later in the video. Now let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. This build is meant to give you a really solid set of core components along with the least overpriced graphics card I could find. This will allow you to play at 1080p, 60 plus FPS in any game, and then in the future when graphics card prices return to normal, you could upgrade to something like an RTX 3060. This PC is also great for streaming and some video editing. I went with components that are all high quality, reliable, and a good value per dollar. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start talking about each of the parts in this $800 gaming beast. For the CPU, I went with something that shouldn't surprise many of you, which is the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. This is probably the best value per dollar gaming CPU you can currently buy. At a little under $200, it's not the cheapest option, but it provides a ton of features and performance. This is a 6 core, 12 thread CPU based on AMD's Zen 2 architecture. It has a base and boost clock of 3.6 and 4.2 gigahertz respectively, but what's really cool is the fact that it's unlocked, meaning it can easily be overclocked for even more performance. Now yes, new Ryzen CPUs were recently released, but if you've tried to get one, then you know that finding one at MSRP is pretty difficult right now. Also, the cheapest Ryzen 5000 series CPU released was the 5600X, which is a $300 part, which is a little too costly for this $800 budget. Now, one other nice thing about the CPU is the fact it comes with a stock cooler in the box. This is the AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler, which is basic, but it gets the job done. It's pretty much just a hunk of extruded aluminum with a fan attached, which is fine because it performs great and you'll be able to see the temps later in the benchmark section. Going for an aftermarket cooler would have produced better temps and allowed for a decent overclock, but you really can't beat the value of the Wraith Stealth Cooler because it comes free in the box. For the motherboard, I wanted something that would allow for future upgrades and expansion, so I decided to go for a B550 board for that reason. Some of the B550 boards can get pretty expensive, but the one I got comes in at around $115, which is a really good deal. This is the ASRock B550M Pro 4, one of my favorite motherboards on the market right now. This is a micro ATX board, but it offers a lot of PCIe expansion, multiple M.2 slots, four DIMM slots, good back panel I.O., and decent VRMs for overclocking. I also think this board looks really nice, but that's just my subjective opinion. And yes, this is a micro ATX board in an ATX case, but it worked out and looks fine in my opinion. Moving on to RAM, this is another area where I went with a pretty predictable choice. When picking out these parts, I looked for a 16GB kit of DDR4 RAM with a speed of 3600MHz. What I got was this Oloy Owl RAM that's a 2x8GB kit, which again runs at 3600MHz CL18. This isn't the greatest RAM by any means, but for around $70, it's a great value per dollar. 3600 megahertz is kind of the sweet spot to pair with a CPU like the 3600, and it's imperative to have fast RAM because Ryzen CPUs rely heavily on RAM speed to get the most performance out of them. These sticks have a basic black design and no RGB, which fits the build fine in my opinion. 16 gigabytes is enough for modern gaming, streaming, and even 1080p video editing. With that being said, RAM is pretty cheap right now, so if you're wanting to stream or do content creation, then going for 32 gigabytes might not be a bad idea. Idea. For storage, I did what I normally do, which is get a good quality SSD with decent capacity, which should offer plenty of space for the time being, with the option to upgrade mass storage in the future. What I went with is the 500GB Crucial P1. This is a blazing fast NVMe SSD in the M.2 form factor, which basically makes it the size of a stick of gum. The P1 has DRAM, which is ideal for a boot drive. 500GB should be enough for your OS, applications, and a modest games library. Again, for 50 bucks later down the line, you 
you could add a two terabyte mechanical drive for games and other mass storage. And if you're interested in adding that right off the bat, then I'll have it linked in the description with all the other parts featured in this video. Moving on to the graphics card, this was the hardest part of the build to source. At the time of sourcing these parts, the only card I could find around MSRP that fit into the budget was the AMD RX 5500 XT 4GB. This is the ASRock Challenger model. This is an ideal and a few months ago you could probably have fit a 5600 XT or maybe even a 2060 in this budget, but at $225 this wasn't horribly overpriced like the other options. Now by the time this video comes up, these 5500 XTs might be all sold out or overpriced, so your other option is to grab an RX 580 off of eBay for around $180. Bucks. You're going to again have to get a 4GB model because of pricing, but the RX 580 should perform very similarly to the 5500 XT in this video, but will use a bit more power. The 5500 XT and RX 580 are both great for AAA titles at 60 plus FPS and esports games at 144 FPS with settings adjusted accordingly. This should be good enough for most people, but like I said towards the beginning of the video, you could always upgrade later down the line to something like an RTX 3060 when pricing returns to normal. To power the system, I wanted to get a unit that was 500 watts or greater with an 80 plus bronze rating from a reputable manufacturer. What I went with is the EVGA 600BA. Like the name implies, this is a 600 watt power supply with efficiency rating of 80 plus bronze. EVGA is a very reputable brand and is my go-to choice for budget power supplies. This unit, at around six. $60 is a decent value. It is non-modular, but it has all black sleeve cables and the extra ones can be hidden in the back of the case. 600 watts is way more than enough for this build and offers enough headroom for future expansion. Sure, it wouldn't be smart to pop in a 3080 in here, but a 3070 or lower should run just fine on this system with the R5 3600. To hold all these parts, I went with a case that I've seen pop up a few times, which is the DIY PC Shadow Case. This is a pretty compact ATX mid tower, and for the $65 price tag it offers a great value. It's not the highest quality case I've ever seen, but the features it offers is great. It is a large tempered glass side panel, a power supply basement, and best of all, a full mesh front panel with three included ARGB fans. These fans are surprisingly good and they look awesome in my opinion. This case was decently easy to build in and I can definitely give it my recommendation. There's plenty of airflow and even without an exhaust fan, temps were more than okay. All in all, for $800 you're getting a set of parts that are high quality, reliable, and offer a great value. Now I'll be showing you performance in a minute, but if you're interested in learning how to build this PC, then make sure you're subscribed so you can see next week's step-by-step -step guide on assembling this PC, installing Windows, and getting it all set up. Now before we get into the benchmarks, I want to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Yubico, who has one of my new favorite gadgets, the YubiKey. The YubiKey is like having a physical key for protecting your electronic devices and online accounts. There are a few different models, and the one I have here is the YubiKey 5 NFC. I like it because it it works with my desktop, laptop, and even my smartphone through NFC. It's a lot more convenient than a digital authenticator and it's super compact so I can leave it on my keychain. Like I said earlier in the video, you can use it to add two-factor authentication to your PC, meaning no access unless the key is inserted, and it can be used for two-factor authentication with your online accounts as well. This works with a ton of existing password managers like LastPass, Dashlane, 1Password, and other sites like Google, Dropbox, and Twitter. I have it connected to my password manager of choice, making for a convenient, fast, and ultra-secure system for accessing my online accounts. There's even versions of YubiKey with USB-C and Lightning for connecting directly to your smartphone. What's even cooler is YubiCo is offering a $10 off coupon for my viewers when you use the code TECHBYMAT. Again, all the info and link where to pick up a YubiKey is in the description. Definitely grab one if you're wanting to protect your online activity and if you want to support the channel. Thanks again to Yubico for sponsoring this video and let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. So performance on this system is great, you may have to adjust some of the settings to get your desired frame rates, but this system has no problem running any game you throw at it. Let's start off with Apex Legends, which I tested at 1080p high settings. Doing this resulted in the FPS staying in the low 100s while running around and in the 80s and 90s during combat. Overall, this provided a very smooth and enjoyable experience and you could always drop settings to get even more FPS. Moving on to CSGO, which I accidentally tested at high settings instead of competitive, doing this resulted in the FPS staying in the mid 200s most of the time with a decent amount of fluctuation throughout the match. Now this overall was very smooth and I didn't notice any major drops or stuttering. Next up is Rainbow Six, which I tested at 1080p very high settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 224 FPS average, which should be more 
more than enough for even competitive players. In COD Warzone, I test at 1080p with a mix of medium and low settings. This resulted in the FPS staying in the upper 90s and low 100s most of the time with infrequent frame drops into the 80s. Overall performance was pretty good on this title. Next is Rust which I tested at 1080p medium settings and doing this resulted in an average in the mid 90s. This was very smooth but there was a weird texture pop and thing going on which I wasn't sure if it was the server or PC or settings causing it. So if you do know what it is, let me know in the comments below. Finally, I tested Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p high settings. I used the built-in benchmark which resulted in a decent 73 FPS average. Overall, performance on this system is pretty good. If GPU prices were normal, then you would have been able to fit a much more powerful card in this system, but it is what it is and the 5500 XT should work well for the near future. Now there were a ton of ways I could have went with part selection, so if you would have done something different, then let me know. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. Thanks again to Yubico for sponsoring this video, and again, head to the description to pick up a Yubi key of your own. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.